Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Timea Schutte, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 10th high-level policy session of the 2020 WISIS Forum. In the next hour, we, with the help of our distinguished panelists, we will be exploring the ethical dimensions of information and knowledge society. We will kick off with the overview of the topic, explore a few national examples, initiatives, and projects from around the world, and then dive deeper into a few topical considerations around privacy, social inclusion, and gender equality. Before we start, just a few housekeeping rules for our audience. We have a roster of exceptional panelists with us today who will each set out their views and thoughts on these topics. While they are speaking, I ask you to kindly keep your microphones on mute at all times. If you are experiencing bandwidth issues, it is also advised to keep your cameras turned off. While the panel discussion is going on, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box and we will transmit them to the speakers in the second part of our session. Please also know that there is live captioning for this session. You can find the um, closed captioning button um, at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom. I also kindly ask our distinguished panelists to try and keep their allocated time so that all speakers get the chance to share their thoughts and we can have some time at the end for questions for the audience. So without further ado, I would like to turn first to our action line facilitator from UNESCO to lead us into our discussion and give us her introductory remarks to provide some context for the session and set the scene. She is UNESCO's Chief of Bioethics and Ethics of Science and Technology, where she leads different activities aimed at reinforcing capacities of member states to manage bioethical challenges and to identify the ethical, legal, and social implications of cutting edge science, emerging technologies, and their application for sustainable development. She is also responsible for um, the Secretariat of UNESCO's International Bioethics Committee and World Ethics Commission of Science and Technology. Madam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me put this. Uh, I think this is better, right? Thank you very much for this kind invitation, and I'm very happy to share this panel with all these distinguished speakers. Uh, I, I would like to share with you very briefly, and I hope this will help to set the, the tone, as you said, uh, of what exactly UNESCO is doing right now regarding ethics of artificial intelligence. Uh, so in 2019, the General Conference of UNESCO, meaning all member states, uh, they gave the mandate to the Director General to uh, start the process of elaborating a non-binding instrument in the form of recommendation on ethics of artificial intelligence uh, to be possibly adopted by UNESCO uh, 40th uh, General Conference in 2021. So you can see the schedule is very tight. And uh, how, wh how is this supposed to be happening is uh, in two steps that I will be very briefly uh, describing to you. First, a multi-stakeholder, multicultural, multidisciplinary and pluralist consultative process to, which is the first phase, followed by an intergovernmental negotiation. And the expected outcome, outcome as I just said, is an instrument, of a, a non-binding recommendation of ethics of artificial intelligence, but with the aim of being the first global standard setting instrument in this area. Because we know that there are so many uh, initiatives already around the world and many regional and national, etc. So the non-governmental phase is the first draft of the recommendation that was prepared by 24 members of an ad hoc group uh, appointed by the Director General in their personal capacity. This first draft was published in May. These 20, there are 24 experts because UNESCO has six, regional, six regions of the world. So the idea is to have representation worldwide, but also from different very uh, uh, disciplinary and, and ethical backgrounds and different professions and also those who have some experience with, with private sector, although not representing specific companies, those who are working with civic, civil society, for example. So all this kind, we wanted really to have a multi, the same representativity among these 24 experts. So since they are uh, in their personal capacities, they are not bringing an official representation or views for their countries. Then in the phase that we are now, after being the, this draft was published in May, we are under and taking now the uh, same again multi-stakeholder global and regional consultation. All the regionals are virtual and the purpose is to 
people around the world to enrich the debate and have an open and participatory process. So these, pre these 24 experts prepared a first draft. Now it is open for consultation in all the six regions of UNESCO, but there is also an online platform. And I, I'm copying the link here in case any of you want to still go in and provide us with your comments and, uh, and share it with uh, others. Uh, it will be very important because you can make comments, but you can also propose specific text that you want uh, to be reflected in the document. This is how it looks. Now, the second uh, phase of the, of the elaboration of the document is that the non-government, non uh, well, for, so what will, sorry, uh, after this, uh, all these consultations, both, both region and, and online, uh, the, the 24 experts are going to meet at the end of August and they are going to revise all these inputs that have come uh, through these consultations and they are going to prepare a second draft, which will be the final document that it will submit it to the member states and they will have to provide us with comments since September to the end of the year. And then we come really directly to the second phase, which is the completely governmental one, which is that uh, the document that will be provided to, to, for comments and then it will be finalized at the end of the year with the comments from member states. It will go uh, into in 2020 now, 2021. Uh, into two sessions of intergovernmental expert committees who are going to discuss the content and are going to negotiate it and hopefully finally come to an agreement of a text that will be adopted by the general conference at the end of 2021. So why UNESCO is embarking in this initiative when there is, as we said before, so many uh, initiatives and the, and the field is so very crowded. So uh, the, the, general the general conference considered that, there, that currently there is no truly international and global ethical framework for this, in, for this field. Uh, also, UNESCO is the leading agency at the UN level in bioethics and ethics of science and technology for more than 27 years. We not only have a lot of capacity building programs, but we also have advisory bodies working uh, in this particular area for bioethics and ethics of science and technology. And producing the only global normative instrument is in this area, like for example, bioethics uh, and human rights, uh, ethics of climate change, uh, genome editing and human rights, among others. And it also has adopted the wrong principles that play an important role in the life cycle of AI. It is also unique because uh, of the specificities of its mandate. Uh, UNESCO is multidisciplinary, it's multicultural and, plural, and has a pluralistic approach. Uh, so we in UNESCO, we, uh, this is the way we operate and for, and for uh, the, producing this document on AI is not an exception. We want to produce a document that will include the voices of the Global South that are normally not participating in the other discussions and initiatives and not, not part of the mainstream, focusing on environment and the ecosystem, which is something that is not very, very often taken into account, but also as part of our mandate, culture, education, the sciences, both natural and, 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 uh, and social and human, communication, and all the time keeping in mind gender as, because it's one of the priorities of our organization. So the document structure is, uh, uh, is expected to define the shared values and principles. This is, what, this is the, the point of the part. And then these values and principles should be then uh, transformed into concrete policy measures uh, on ethics of AI that are addressed not only to member states, but uh, many other stakeholders. But also it's important to mention that it will include a monitoring dimension. So member states will have to report every four years on how this recommendation is implemented. So this is the, as, as at the moment, this is how it stands. This is the structure, of course, a preamble, the aims and objectives, values and principles and areas of policy action, and I said, and the monitoring and evaluation as the more, most important things. I want just to end, to say again, why is it important to have an ethical approach to ethics of AI? Because uh, you know there is also some much debate about ethics, human rights. So for us, uh, for UNESCO, being uh, it's also thought that it, the ethics is one of the va added values that it can bring to the discussion. Because in an, at the end of the day, ethics is about making explicit the values that lie behind our policies, our actions, and choices that we apply to any human decision making. 
And of course, that applies also for AI. And despite of all the differences that we have, we have to make very explicit what all the, 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 the values that we have, which might differ in many cases, but it's very clear in, in the UN system that human rights are the basic common ground. So in, in, in case of any discrepancy on, on values, we, the, the minimum ground and the basic common ground for everybody should be human rights, which at the end of the day are also there to protect some values that we have like freedom and many others. So AI technologies are not value neutral. So they should be firmly grounded in these certain common foundation human values, in particular, the international human rights framework, as I just said. And because, it, because it's not only a technological turning point, but also an anthropological disruption, it has really changed the whole social tissue, the way we understand each other, the way we make decisions in issues so, more, so important, such as health, uh, law, education, the way we understand science. So it, and it really the social tissue of our society. So this is why it's so important because what, what are the values that are driving all these discussions needs to be put on the front. So given the importance of the impact of the fast and the fast phase uh, pace in which they are developing, it is also very important to make sure that the downsides and the potential harms to human rights, fundamental freedoms and universal ethical principles are addressed. Okay, so this is how it looks like for the moment. As you can see, there are some values uh, that are not to be that are not to be negotiated: human dignity, human rights, leaving no one behind. The values are supposed to, to uh, they are supposed to um, inspire. Then you have principles that are the ones who are supposed to be uh, for, uh, giving you guidance and to produce the specific uh, the specific policy actions that you want to do and my closing remark is that the recommendation is not it's only a starting framing point uh, it's a, it's the, the starting point it's just to frame how to address these ethical issues and also the uh, human rights concerns but it must be completed with strong actions on capacity building support its implementation transforming legal frameworks to ensure that ai is shaped in a way that benefits humanity and the planet and of course as unesco is also very much always very much involved in capacity building uh, it's very much keen in supporting these processes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing um, this very thorough overview and the UNESCO's projects and also for inviting us to participate in, in your consultations. So against this uh, very comprehensive backdrop, we will now explore some lessons learned from the national experience um, of our panelists. And first, I'd like to turn to the Distinguished Director General of the Postal and Telecommunications Regulatory Authority of Zimbabwe. Sir, you have over 34 years experience in the civil service in your home country and also a vast international experience building partnerships with countries across Asia. In your opinion, how can knowledge societies manage the ethical dimensions that come into play when generating, sharing and making available knowledge that may be used to improve human development? And what has been the experience in Zimbabwe? So you are still on mute. If you could please unmute yourself, we are not able to hear you. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, facilitator. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, let me begin by saying that we live in a world where the creation, where the organization, uh, the dissemination and the use of information is mostly done through the click of a button. Uh, many people across the world and in Zimbabwe tend to the internet for a variety of information. It can be the study material for educational purposes or just self-improvement information. It can be self-help information that assists them in solving a problem in the home or at work or even in business. It can also be treatment solutions for a healthy problem. Currently, the COVID-19 crisis has seen many internet doctors churning out prescriptions on social media and the internet for the pandemic. Unfortunately, there is no quality assurance of information posted on the internet. Anyone 
can post anything and even claim to be an expert. Some of the solutions can even turn out to be harmful, while some of them can add a wealth of useful uh, knowledge and information. The advent of various technologies and increased the interconnectedness has not eliminated the ethics relating to information, but increased the ethical concerns in various dimensions. Identification of the relevant ethics and their various facets is critical for knowledge societies to deal with the issues involved. These ethical concerns are what WISH Action Line C10 deals with. The first step that can be taken by knowledge societies in dealing with the ethical issues that may arise is to identify the dimensions. The next step is to come up with measures to manage the ethical issues and the last one is to come up with sanctions for an ethical behavior. The basic principles of ethics that come to mind include integrity and accuracy of information, piracy and confidentiality, copyright and plagiarism, security and intellectual property. And in addition, knowledge societies also need to consider issues arising from emerging technologies, especially the use of artificial agents in activities that require moral decisions to be made, such as self-driven cars where there is no human intervention. They also need to consider the implications of Internet of Things, where intelligent gadgets make decisions that may require moral considerations to be taken into account. Technology is a tendency. A tendency to make what is an ethical look normal and acceptable. A person that would never contemplate walking into a bookshop or a music store to steal a book or music CD may not see anything wrong in downloading a book or music in a way that makes him avoid paying the author or the singer. The ease with which one can copy and paste material may make students and workshop presenters plagiarize other people's work without any problem. Individuals can deal with information integrity issues by checking the credentials of authors, verifying information against a primary source and evaluating uh, the website. Methods of dealing with the ethical dimensions at corporate and government level would of necessity include putting in place codes of ethics, having robust secure systems, formulating internet use policies, and promulgating laws that govern creation and dissemination of information as well as treaty level agreements among countries. Censorship is an age-old method that can also be useful. Zimbabwe has had its fair share of information and knowledge dissemination, just as other parts of the world have grappled with hacking. Government systems in Zimbabwe and banking systems have been targeted. Some of its people have been lured into pyramid schemes or fallen victim to phishing and identity theft. And, um, uh, 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 and have had their computer systems compromised. While privacy data breaches in Zimbabwe have not been spectacular, as some incidences in other countries, we have, as Zimbabwe, had our fair share. Uh, however, Zimbabwe has come up with policies that encourage both public and private sector to secure their computer systems and websites. The local banks have robust firewall systems to ensure safe transactions. Laws in place include copyright and intellectual property laws. The right to privacy is enshrined in the constitution, while confidentiality contracts are the uh, norm in intercompany transactions and consultancy arrangements, as well as cross-border transactions. A new cybersecurity and data protection bill is due to become law soon to enhance the existing laws. 
Universities use plagiarism checkers to ensure the students do not commit this offense. These laws simply complement the moral norms that are ingrained in every Zimbabwean, uh, that of uh, Ubuntu, which is the nature of our personality. This concept is promoted con uh, continuously by our government and the Postal and Telecommunication Regulatory Authority of Zimbabwe in the quest to achieve the ethical target of bridging the digital divide to ensure that every citizen joins the information highway and participates as a full member of our knowledge society. I, I thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing the perspectives and the examples from Zimbabwe. We will take a small leap from Zimbabwe now and land in Italy, where I turn to our next speaker, uh, Special Advisor to the Minister of Innovation and Digitalization. He is also serving as a member of the House of Representatives within the Italian Parliament, where he sits on the Permanent Committee for Industry, Trade, R&D, Innovation and Tourism. Sir, in your work, um, you come across various implementations of technology, um, be that in different sectors or use cases. In your experience, should different uses of technology, either in government or the private sector, be held to different regulatory standards? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, distinguished colleagues, for this uh, invitation and for the topic of discussion that uh, today is very, very urgent, uh, even due to the COVID-19 uh, that uh, has uh, in a sort of way uh, as a force uh, an uh, important revolution in uh, the technology issue. And we are facing and um, I am very confident to say that, uh, that uh, this is revolution it will, will uh, bring uh, some uh, changes far deeper than any other uh, revolution. And the way we approach in, uh, this uh, kind of revolution today will define uh, the world we live in uh, tomorrow. And uh, the choices we are facing today are related to the fundamental ethical uh, issues about the impact of this uh, new technology revolution in our society and i would like to focus on one kind of uh, uh, one aspect of uh, this revolution and uh, this is uh, notably artificial intelligence and its uh, ai and due to this strong impact of ai in our society most developing countries have adopted different approach on ai which reflect their own political, economic, cultural, and social system. If I have to make an example, in the United States and China, large companies are investing a lot in AI and they are exploiting large amounts of data. Instead, overall, in my country and in Europe as well, we are lagging behind in private investment, just because maybe because most of um, enterprises in uh, Europe are a small and medium. We are, uh, the enterprises are more than 90%, so it's very difficult for them to reach the fund. Um, I think that uh, just to take this issue about the question between uh, the trade-off uh, of a regulatory standard be between uh, public uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, private sector, I think that each state has its own conception how to manage the market. Even in the EU, we have a several vision. And uh, I think that it's, it's uh, crucial that uh, every government, each government, supports company efforts, uh, removing burdens for economic activities. And this strategy is rely on the market uh, in order to foster the innovation. And this is one side. And the other side uh, is uh, the government set the standard of transparency coding, focusing on the concept of human-centric vision, that it means transparency. So the political, that's because I, I am a politician, in this case plays a fundamental role, because the algorithm of selection entices a political decision. I'm, uh, I am very proud that I am sitting in a representation of United Nations. It's named a high level panel of digital cooperation and I'm sitting in a round table of AI. And this kind of uh, 
high-level panel of digital cooperation uh, with the under secretary, uh, general under secretary of the UN, will uh, set up an advisory board on AI that will act as a convening platform to promote and facilitate global coordination and cooperation with, between the numerous entities creating a global multi-stakeholder network. The three pillars that are, I think that are very important and I would like to share with you. The first pillar is to outreach the further constituents of this round table, focusing, of course, with a, a major priority on the Global South. Uh, to, uh, the second pillar is attracting experts uh, consultation. And the third is mapping existing work, create a repository of knowledge about AI, so avoiding the duplicate. Let's just, let me just uh, focus on about the Italy position very quickly. Uh, Italy has been at the forefront in recognizing the importance of protecting and defending human rights on the internet with the Internet Bill of the Rights in 2015. The highest point of 10 years long process of debate that included a commission of multi-stakeholder experts and a public consultation before it was approved by the Italian Parliament. The, this declaration has been prized and recognized by the Council of the Euro Parliamentary Assembly as well by the WWW Foundation as a landmark example of promoting and defending human rights online. The COVID-19 crisis has shown that internet is an essential resource for our societies and economics, from trade to health to education. No country could have survived the lockdown without, the, without internet. The need to ensure access for all the protection in human rights has become even more urgent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, insights. Um, you've mentioned um, the importance of working together and supporting both the public and private sector. Um, and to explore this a little bit further, I'm going to turn now for him to our next speaker, who is a board member of the International Federation for Information Processing, IFIP, and chair of um, IFIP's International Professional Practice Partnership, known as, known as IP3. Madam, how do you see the cooperation between the different stakeholders and what support does IFIP provide to governments, organizations and the information society to help them promote and ensure ethical behaviors? Thank you, Tamara. Um, before I answer the question, let me position the International Federation for Information Processing, IFIP, role and interest in ethical behavior. We all agree that for information and knowledge societies to use digital products, they must trust in the product. What is trust based on? Well, surely it's heavily reliant on ethics. We all have seen how technology and other organizations suffer reputational damage, in some cases never to recover because of a failure of ethics. Would you trust someone who's not ethical? To quote my colleague, um, Don Gotteban, the commonly held belief is that we are all ethically good. Um, Coupled with the ease in which we make most of our day-to-day -day ethical decisions, leads us to believe that evil is done by evil people. I'm not an evil person and therefore I cannot do evil. We must take the extra time to actually consider a decision or a computer system's potential impact on a broad range of stakeholders. And really think like the medical profession, first do no harm. To support our role as ethical behavior, we've set up a code of, we've set up a code of ethics, um, an art of code of ethics as an exemplar. It's a great concern to us that there are so many codes out there, more than 170 at last count. I must point out that at least 70 of those deal with AI. This provides confusion and allows individuals and organizations to choose the code that suits them best. The code, ARFIP code, will be published digitally in September this year and in book format in 2021. A code of ethics gives voice to values. There should be one or two exemplars that set the standard form through a consultative process. Substantial codes of ethics that go beyond saying, be good. When much ethical decision making is unconscious, it's important to actually raise consciousness when it comes to new situations which means that examples of ethical decision-making are essential. Enforcement of codes is the wrong focus. 
we need to walk towards ethics as being part of everybody's DNA. They must live the values. I would promote professionalism in RCT. One of our strategic goals is IT as a global profession. We encourage member societies and others in the RCT industry at large to have a code of ethics. Indeed, going forward, we will encourage the use of the IFRP code of ethics as a starting point, which members can amend or add to as it suits local conditions, and to promote professionalism among their members and the broader RCT community. Ethics and trust, along with competence, are founding principles of any profession. RCT is no different. RP3 accredits those member societies who meet the defined standard for conferring professional gains on their members. We do not believe it's easy to regulate professional and ethical behavior, but governments can set the example. We encourage governments to procure digital products and services from certified RCT professionals. IFRP can also guide governments on this and assist with adapting the RCT ethics, of, sorry, the code of ethics as a guiding tool and ensuring that procurement processes for digital products and services are from trustworthy organizations. King four principles of governance, followed by many organizations around the world, propose that organizations have an ethics committee that considers all operations and decisions through an ethical lens. In some countries, for South Africa, my own country, for example, setting up such a committee is prescribed in the Companies Act. All governments should consider this in their regulations and certainly have such a committee in their own organizations. A misuse of code of ethics is called ethics washing, where companies give the appearance of being very concerned about ethics to avoid the application of external regulations and yet do nothing to respond positively to those concerns when they do arise. For example, promoting AI for good while developing and selling questionable surveillance software is ethics washing. IFRP also contends that there's an ethical imperative to leave nobody behind. We have a project, Digital Skills for Everyone Everywhere. This project will work with other bodies, including UN structures and global nonprofit organizations. The outcome will be a framework for digital skills for end users, consumers, and IT professionals that can be used to roll out digital skills in any profession. The framework will align with the sustainable development goals, embed the fear and care principles, and take guidance from UN Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. We welcome anyone who would like to partner with us on this project. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, the insights on these initiatives and, and, and the progress you are making. Um, I want to build a little bit on, on, the, um, on the various principles that our previous speakers have, uh, have highlighted. Um, they talked about uh, privacy, about inclusion, about diversity. So I want to turn to our next panelist, the distinguished chairman um, of the board of the Latvia State Radio and Television Center. Um, who during his professional career has worked in state capital companies and public authorities related to the field of electronic communications. And I want to ask you, sir, how, um, how do you feel about um, privacy issues? How will automatic data processing in the provision of proactive digital services affect individuals' perception of privacy? Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm proud to be and represent Latvia on this forum. Uh, uh, today I'd like to share some experience of Latvia when we develop digital services and uh, the provision of those digital services a new uh, absolutely proactive level and related uh, ethical aspect at the same time. The principles of pro uh, proactivity in provision of service can be ensured at different levels in line with the context of the service and the institutional capacities. At the basic level, we can implement a, a, as proactive information and status uh, statements, and we do in all countries already that. But uh, in another form, reminders uh, can be proceeded. Higher added value for the population and also efficiency for institutions can be caused by service automation, where the service is executed automatically, taking into account uh, the data at the disposal on, of information or register other registers if the results have achieved uh, are proportional uh, to the uh, cost and implementation, uh, implementing uh, automated enforcement. 
Latvia is a fast in a fast transition of the service uh, approach from reactive to proactive. One highlights the ma uh, maturity of the provision of new public services. This will ensure a more complex uh, ex ex exercise uh, of citizens and business rights, reduce uh, administrative burdens and uh, highlight higher public satisfaction with uh, the service provided by the state, as well as higher efficiency in the work of the authority. The proactive provision of service should be based on data available to national regulatory authorities without creating an administrative burden on the user and ensuring the outcome of the service is reached without any action being taken by, uh, taken by user so as to approach the invisible administration in the supply of the service. It facilitates uh, uh, the open and reuse of data held by the national administration. The ethical principles and value applies in the field of public service should address as a key issue of trust in both uh, development, the, in, in both aspects of development of digital systems, as well in the civil uh, servants and their responsibilities in general. Such an approach should uh, cover fundamental values which should be guided by the judgment of officials on the basis of, uh, of day-to-day -day task and their relations with the public. The, de uh, develop, uh, the deployment and development of proactive services are linked to public confidence. Citizens expect the country's uh, development of proactive digital services to respect individuals' freedoms and, sensi and sensitive data to serve the public interest. The integration of digital resources uh, of public administration, data security and uh, development are prerequisite and a basis for public confidence, which is uh, a cornerstone of the good governance. In the context, uh, in the context it should be important uh, to know two ethical aspects. The first is to develop, uh, to develop and implement proactive digital solutions in the framework of high ethical standards of public sector representatives and information society policy makers. Second, digital service algorithms should incorporate principles where the realization and the provision of service could affect the values and ethical principles of so society or their evaluation. Consequently, the importance of ethical principles and value in the information uh, in formulation of modern public service cannot be uh, overstated. It is important to provide both public officials and society as well with a, a common system of ethical principles. A key element uh, is to promote a common understanding of the need for citizen involvement and proactive support and acceptance of proactive services. Citizens should, uh, citizen should raise awareness of their extensive data processing without their direct involvement, whether the medical data, travel, or financial transaction data. Clear digital solution for individual consent should be defined. The debate uh, on ethical action in proactive public service highlights the issue of personal data protection. It is important to organize awareness uh, rising activities to protect uh, personal data as a context of provision of pro uh, proactive services. The development of digital services should respect the fundamental values of freedom, equality, solidarity, and others. The implementation of successful process should ensure transparency and integrity of the action carried out by the national administration. The technologies used for extensive data processing, uh, for example, artificial intelligence, machine learning, biometric data processing, and multi-scale decision-making should ensure clear respect for social values and be based on transparent operating principles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your comments. Um, to build uh, and keep this um, line of, of talking about values and principles, um, I'd like to dig a little deeper into the topic of ethics and social inclusion. Um, and I turn to our next speaker, the founder and CEO of um, ORU, um, the Social Network for Social Good. Um, you founded and developed your company with a mission to enhance social and economic inclusion. Could you tell us a little bit about ORU and how the platforms and technological solutions you provide work to achieve universal impact and social inclusion and how you integrate the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal into this? 
Thank you very much. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you, you know, from uh, beautiful Malta. Um, as, you, as it was mentioned, you know, earlier, um, we, we, we are living an unprecedented moment and we are see seeing that uh, this uh, um, crisis we all have lived uh, uh, together uh, that is still underway can actually be a, a commune denominator for joining forces and building the world of tomorrow uh, on principles which will be both universal and inclusive. And, and in that regards, uh, um, we have built uh, uh, with OU Group, which is based in Switzerland, um, uh, a technology and, and solutions that both integrate the social media uh, aspect of social networks for connecting for good, for meaningful connectivity. And at the same time, uh, we have leveraged the blockchain technology uh, 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 for uh, bringing a purchasing power uh, to citizens around the planet that will be striving and advocating for positive actions. So let me uh, uh, share my screen briefly. So I will be uh, 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 sharing with you, you know, the technology that we have, uh, uh, that we have built. So, so basically, um, all you, you know, first of all, we have a perception uh, of today's reality and that perception indeed uh, is that uh, the challenges we are facing all over the world are paramount. And we have the luck and the chance to have uh, 193 countries uh, that have uh, validated the 2030 agenda with the United Nations. So this is now a time and the reality where all together at a public-private partnership level, we have to work together to bring uh, those sustainable principles into reality of citizens. What is important as well to note, it's the private sector is getting more and more understanding that embracing those principles are actually not only uh, 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 an aspect of positioning themselves uh, for marketing reasons, but actually a, a, a real way to differentiate and to build a higher and stronger value. And it is interesting to note that during the crash uh, uh, on the stock market uh, because of the COVID, some aspect of the most resilient companies were about their active involvement into corporate social responsibility. At the same time, we see that the citizens are getting more and more conscious and aware that they have a vote and their vote can be exist uh, on the political aspect, but as well on which product and which company they will choose because of the principle of how those companies are inclusive and are giving back. So today there are many good initiatives like we are seeing today with people from multi countries doing amazing things. But what is important is to join forces. So to have a social network where we are capable to share positive content and inspirational actions. And at the same time, being able to leverage blockchain technology with a digital currency, a digital token, where philanthropies, private sectors and citizens are capable to give back. And with that technology, we are capable to channel that funding to NGOs, to innovators and to citizens. And so if I go now to share you how it looks like, uh, uh, basically on our social network, every citizen will be asked to choose up to three sustainable development goals. And then uh, uh, on their profile, they will be able to post on the news feed from all over the world, selecting as well the SDGs that their actions are related to. And based on those elements, they will collect votes, which we call lights. The more lights they collect, the more eligible to receive funding with our digital currency they would get. So every citizen will have a digital wallet. And with the digital currency we have launched, which is called OU Token, we will be able to channel to them directly funding. And those funding will be able to be used in multiple ways, including as well uh, uh, with a marketplace that we have launched and uh, uh, that is now in beta and will be launched by the end of the year, which will be the first marketplace to buy and sell products with an aspect that integrate as well the SDG they are related to. So for, for us, what is important, it's actually to understand 
that nowadays we are capable to leverage this challenge that we are all facing. And we are capable to embrace joining forces, leveraging technology in to find a way to bring every citizen in an aspect of integration in the value channel process on an inspirational base and at the same time on how we can all be part of building a world more harmonious and more sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, turning to our last speaker, um, I want to stay on this topic of inclusion. Um, when we talk about ethics and technology, the issue of bias quickly comes to mind and oftentimes we agree on the need for diversity around the table to nip potential biases in the bud. I would add to this that we need not only diversity around the table, but we need to make sure that diversity is reflected at the highest levels of decision making as well. For a little more insight on this, I turn to our next speaker, who is the editor-in-chief editor um, of the UN Brief, um, where she covers emerging technologies and digital transformation. She was also appointed uh, by the European Commission to the high-level group of experts to review the impact of Horizon 2020 program to fund research and innovation in the European Union. In your area of activity and expertise, how do you see this issue? What can we do to bring more women to decision-making positions in cybersecurity? Thank you very much. I would like to thank the International Telecommunications Union Director General and the Deputy Director General, Mr. Malcolm Johnson, and the organizers of the World Summit on the Information Society. Today, I would like to speak about trust in emerging technologies, building trust. AI is being deployed at the warp speed and there is no oversight, no regulatory framework. There are efforts here and there, but nothing at the scale that is necessary to prevent its nefarious impact on the democratic process at the present. What is artificial intelligence? It's data, troves of data, data sets that can be organized in ways that can make our everyday lives better. Its positive impact on healthcare is tremendous. For instance, collaboration to develop medicines and a vaccine for COVID-19, or on more efficient farming, or to help us better understand climate change. But many are using AI now to undermine democratic institutions with the fallacy of algorithms, with its lack of transparency and invasion of privacy. As the digital transformation of all sectors of the economy rolls out, AI is a matter of central importance to ensure that our societies remain open, fair, and inclusive. AI has been already for decades defining our everyday experiences online, from travel apps to the social media content that we post, artificial intelligence and machine learning, are defining our experiences. Who designs the algorithms? How is the data collected? And who is benefiting from the data insights? Which brings me to the point of cybersecurity and how important it is that we create safeguards, not only to prevent abusive, abusive uses by authoritarian governments and private sector actors, but to prevent these vast quantities of data points on individuals to, to not fall in the hands of criminals or spouses, partners seeking to retaliate. Tomorrow, four beloved American big tech companies, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Apple, companies that we love for their ease of use and frictionless transactions when needed, will go before the US Congress to testify on the consequences of their unbridled powers. The value they extract from their social media networks without the permission of individuals, citizens, is something that we just started to understand. It's just because mainstream, it just became mainstream when two British news organizations, The Guardian and The Observer, conducted an investigation on the Cambridge Analytica scandal, the public relations agency that in partnership with Facebook broke campaign laws in the UK and used false information to distort the perception of voters, which led to a disastrous result 
for the UK economy. And there are others, mis other misuses of automated political campaign, campaigning using artificial intelligence to another of Facebook's properties, WhatsApp that led to the illegitimate ascension to power of a less than qualified candidate to lead the largest South American economy. These are just some of the examples of misuses of data of artificial intelligence in the political sphere. They might seem trivial, but they have real implications for the economies in question, for the job security of its citizens, and as COVID-19 responses, mismanagement has shown it's a matter of life and death. Once data is being sold, resold, and citizens have no control over this, social media platforms skirt being publishers under Section 230 of the US Code. One may ask, why are these big tech companies not subject to greater regulatory measures? They have been undermining our democracies, inciting violence and hate, and caused the death of thousands of people using our data, AI, and ML. I wish I could finish on a more upbeat note, but here it is. Let's hope that COVID-19 makes the new masters of the universe more cognizant that the wealth of a country is its people. And if you continue treating them like they do not matter, they will rise, like we are seeing now. So there is hope. Let's see what tomorrow brings, literally. The ITU has a great opportunity and a responsibility to make these companies accountable. They come here to these meetings to negotiate telecommunications deals in sub-Saharan Africa, in the entire continent actually, and in Asia, in Latin America. If the ITU is facilitating these marketing entries, it will take its powerful position. Facebook, Google, and others are held accountable in their business practices, their deployment of AI, and that their hiring processes are transparent and inclusive for starters. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your views with us as well. Well, this concludes our uh, panel discussion portion of, um, of our event. Um, we have, uh, I see eight minutes on the clock and I see there was one question in the chat to our panelists. I'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A function if you have any questions to share with us uh, or any thoughts. While I ask um, our distinguished representative from UNESCO who the question was directed at, um, our uh, audience member asks who will, um, who will have oversight and who will uh, enforce compliance to the ethical issues or, or breaches? Um, would you like to take that question, Daphna? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, of course, this is one of the most important and uh, complicated questions of, of all. Uh, I guess what we're trying to do with, uh, with this kind of instrument is, as I said at the end, uh, the idea is to have first the framework uh, uh, with uh, with all the ideas that other speakers have said, like leaving no one behind and making sure that every voice and everything, is, and and how to ensure that there is this compliance also for private sector through the governments because here's an intergovernmental organization. But as but so it's the idea is to see how we can shape this instrument to make also accountable uh, private sector and but, but not but in a way that they what that we all collaborate as it was said for uh, by one of the rest of the panelists this is something that we have to to deal with it together because this is about same as COVID. I mean, this this is showing that we need to be working for for humanity together. Now, what UNESCO concretely is expecting to do, as I said at the end of my talk, is to help member states to rate, to strengthen their own capacities internally. Uh, at the national level, because that's one of the issues, also at the regulatory level. That's why the that's why the idea is to have policy recommendations and follow-ups. But the uh, so the so on one hand, the idea is to support the, the 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 countries at the national level. But there is also a very important uh, dimension, which is the international cooperation, and and the idea is also to have mechanisms to first to make sure that each of the of the countries have the the level that they can acquire the level of infrastructure knowledge policy making uh, and policy frameworks and tools 
to, to, to be, but then also to have the international collaboration to ensure that these countries can also, and then also international collaboration among countries, but also among agencies, to make sure that these countries can have this level, but also to make sure that we are also working together uh, towards the same aims, uh, as it was mentioned also by by our colleague from Italy. Um, we are also discussing at the high level and part with the SG uh, about this advisory body to make sure that there is also kind of an, an ethical component on, on, on vigilant or, 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 sur or following up on the ethical ethics of AI. So the idea is really to try to bring together the UN system and the different uh, international, uh, all the international efforts and all the trying to work together to, uh, to trying to build these mechanisms. Great, well, thank you very much for, um, for your answer. Would uh, any of the other panelists like to, like to um, share any insights on, on this topic? Um, of oversight and um, enforcement. If not, then um, I would rather um, take a, a quick moment to, to wrap up some of the learnings um, from our session. I've, I've heard two very important words. I think each panelist mentioned them. One was uh, cooperation and the other one was sharing. Um, and it was all about um, shared values, um, to sharing information, sharing our actions, um, to cooperate so that we can all share in the benefits um, of the information society um, and new technologies. So I want to close our session on this note um, and invite uh, all participants um, and all panelists to continue sharing their work, um, to invite others to share in their work um, so that we can build um, better information and knowledge societies for all. Before uh, we conclude for today, I want to um, thank uh, all our panelists again for being here with us. Um, I want to thank all of our audience members for their participation um, and uh, also want to thank the WSIS Forum co-organizing institutions for putting together this session. The organizers um, would also like to thank all the WSIS Forum supporters and sponsors, um, so please watch this short video to, uh, to thank them. Thank you again, everyone, for your kind support um, for this uh, session. I remind you that the, while this session is over, the WSIS Forum is continuing uh, for a couple of weeks more. So I encourage you all to browse the agenda and attend upcoming sessions of interest. And I remind you also that we will meet again at the final week um, of the WSIS Forum in September to share some of the learnings and outcomes of this session. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah.